Okay. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the ASCRS webinar, Knowing Your Worth at Your Institution. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. We're very excited. Uh, my name is Dr. Kirsten Wilkins, and I'll be co-moderating this webinar with Dr. Stephen Fassler. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, at any time, you can adjust your audio using your computer um, volume settings. Um, if you're having difficulty with any of your computer uh, video audio, you can certainly do a dial-in in the link that was sent to you. Um, just so you all know, the attendees are muted. Um, however, there is the uh, Q&A feature on your screen where you can um, provide questions that we'll um, address at the end of the talk that Dr. Makel is going to give. Um, and then the only other thing we'd ask is that at the conclusion of the program, that you complete a brief evaluation so that you can get your CME credits uh, for the uh, the program tonight. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Fassler, who's going to introduce our speaker, just, uh, Dr. Justin Makel. So we, uh, Dr. Wilkins and I, good evening, uh, we'll be monitoring the chat as well. So any questions that you have, please put them in it so that we can uh, address them at, at the end of the talk. Um, you know, a brief introduction because you want to hear from him, not from from us. Um, Dr. Makel's a 1998 graduate of Tufts uh, University School of Medicine. He then did uh, residency at, at uh, the BI Deaconess uh, Harvard Medical School and finished his fellowship at the University of Minnesota. He came out and, and after a year in practice, he was promoted to be the chief of the division um, which sounds like a very uh, meteoric rise, but I think um, he, he'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Uh, more importantly, he, he took this opportunity to, to start a training program uh, five years after he was there, and he is now the professor of surgery and holds an endowed chair of surgery at, at UMass. In his free time, he serves on editorial boards, has written two textbooks, and is an active member of our society. Um, he's interested in in all aspects of of colorectal surgery, um, but has has found uh, understanding what you bring to an institution uh, an important aspect of what he does as well. And uh, I'm going to stop speaking now and and let Dr. Makel speak. Great, thank you, Dr. Fassler and Dr. Wilkins, and I appreciate the opportunity from ASCRS to to provide this talk tonight. I hope I can I can pull it off. Um, let's see. So this is our disclosure slide, which includes our moderators and our organizers and planners from ASCARS and myself. I do have some disclosures, but none are relevant as it relates to this particular talk. So to further my disclosure talk, I will say that this is really, really considered a taboo topic. And in general, it's more of a don't ask, don't tell type of a policy. My kids are obsessed with finding out how much money I earn on an annual basis. And they ask me all the time. And obviously we've never had that conversation. In fact, my youngest son who's 17 asked me this weekend whether I would share my salary on my deathbed <laughs> to give you a sense for, um, so, for, for the type of a topic we're talking about. I kind of feel like I'm gonna create a virtual room full of monsters here. And I will tell you that I will deny saying any of this, although I think I'm in big trouble because this webinar is being recorded. So the really my, my aim is really focused on fellows and early staff surgeons who are starting their careers. And another disclosure is that I can really only provide an academic practice perspective because I've been here at UMass Memorial for about 20 years. And, um, and I have to tell you, there's a lot that I don't know. And I would say that it's taken me uh, you know, most of my career to understand as much as I'm going to try and get across in this talk tonight. So let's get started. I've broken the talk down into three separate segments. So first, we'll start with the business of surgery. Then we'll talk a bit about surgeon compensation. And then hopefully, we'll bring it all together as it relates to the negotiation process. So when I was asked to talk about your worth to your institution, I went straight to the dictionary. And I looked at um, the definition of worth, and it's the quality that renders something desirable, useful, or valuable. And to be perfectly frank with you, I'm not sure I really feel any of those things when I come to work on a regular basis. And the concept of a quality that, it, that commands esteem or respect, I'm definitely not getting that at home. 
and hopefully we get that a bit when we're at work. It's a quantity of something that may be purchased for a spe specified sum. And sometimes we do feel like we're sort of a cog in, in the engine of a, of a medical center. And I think at the end of the day, what we're interested in learning a little bit of, more about tonight is sort of wealth and riches associated with our profession. So if you type into the internet, um, who is the wealthiest person in the world, uh, you might be directed to this Forbes website, which is a real-time billionaires list. And um, uh, a, a shocker, there are no colorectal surgeons on this list. And as you're considering who the people are on this list, you might um, come up with some of these names. And interestingly, the top 10 are all um, 100 billionaires. Uh, two of these were, um, were created by Microsoft. Two others were created by Google. And at the top of the list is probably the person that came to mind, and that's Elon Musk. And what's interesting about this website is it's actually a real-time um, evaluation. And, um, and for those of you who are not Elon Musk fans, you'll be happy to know that on Monday, when I put the slide together, he had lost $8 billion. So don't worry too much about your retirement portfolios. It goes up and down just like his does. For those of you who are sports fans, you might be thinking about what are the, what's the value of the highest paid athletes in the world. And um, depending on what sport you might be interested, you might come to realize that actually the three highest paid athletes in the world are all soccer players or football players. And so they make between 120 and $136 million per year. So it tells you a couple of things. First of all, what our society values. And the second is that if you're gonna choose a sport for your kid to play, I would suggest that they become soccer players. So let's move on to the talk. So we're gonna start with uh, part one, which is the business of surgery. And um, this is really a topic that very few of us received any education on as we went through medical school, and as we went through our residency program. And so I think that when you're interacting with hospital administrators, you need to learn how to speak their language. And we all know that they have all kinds of crazy terms like opportunity and low hanging fruit and let's unpack that or circle back or let's take this offline. And you don't really need an MBA to really understand the basics of accounting or of most of the conversations you're gonna have with hospital administrators. And I like to use the analogy that it's kind of like ins and outs when we're making rounds in the morning. The ins are the revenue or the money that's coming in based on the work that you're performing. The outs are costs or things that are coming out of the profit and loss statement. And typically that's direct costs and indirect costs, which we'll get into some more detail later on, but direct costs are really those costs that you have more direct control over, whereas indirect costs are more allocated and you have less control over those costs. So you have your ins and you have your outs, and then you have your fluid balance. So the ins minus the outs. And so when you're in these meetings and people are talking about contribution margin and you can't figure out what contribution margin, well, really it's just the revenue minus the direct costs. And we care about that because at the end of the day, that's what we have control over as surgeons. The total margin or the profit loss statement at the end of the day, whether you're positive or negative, is really contribution margin minus those indirect costs also. And that's maybe what your hospital CEO may mo be most interested in to find out whether you're a profitable uh, or you're a money losing service. The other term that we hear about all the time when we're residents is an RVU, like what is a relative value unit? And so an RVU is a measure of work associated with physician services. And that could be an encounter, like an office visit, or it could be a procedure or a, seat or a surgery um, which are um, coded based on CPT codes. The American Medical Association Specialty Society Relative Value Scale Update Committee, or the RUC, as you've heard of, determines RVU values on an every five-year cycle. And services are scored to determine payments. And those RVU values are supposed to cover your work, the work that you do, the expenses associated with it, and the malpractice costs for each procedure that you perform. And these RVU values are independent of charge schedules, patients, insurance coverage, or reimbursement fees. So I really think of it as like a great equalizer. So regardless of where you practice in the United States or what your uh, organizational uh, structure is, a, the RVUs for a certain procedure are, state, are the same across all different sites. And so you can really make comparisons. And hospitals use RVUs as a measure of physician productivity to calculate physician compensation. And that's why they're so important. 
So when we see our moderator, Dr. Wilkins, we see a well-known, well-thought-of colorectal surgeon who cares about her patients and taking great care of them. Her hospital, on, 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 on the other hand, sees an RVU machine, and they are tracking us every single day as it relates to our volume, our productivity, and they have all kinds of um, tracking records to get a sense for what we're doing, whether you realize it or not. So the more they can squeeze out of us, the happier they are. So to give you some RVU examples, so a colonoscopy is valued at three RVUs. If you take out a polyp, it bumps it up to 4.6. Anorectal procedures are higher. Colectomies go up from there. And probably the most valuable procedure that we perform is a J-pouch procedure, which is about 36 RVUs. And as it turns out, insurance providers reimburse RVUs in different disciplines at different rates. And so what you didn't know when you chose colorectal surgery is that colorectal procedures are reimbursed at a very high rate. In fact, they are reimbursed at the highest rate of all divisions in general surgery. So the average being about $78 per RVU, colorectal surgeons are able to collect about a, over $100 per RVU. And that's double the, the, uh, the reimbursement, for example, from the field of trauma. So when you have conversations with your hospital administrators, they value colorectal surgeons because we make them a lot of money. So how are we paid for our services? Well, there are really two main buckets of income that come based on the work that we do. So the first or bucket one is professional fees, or the money that comes into the surgeon or to the medical group. And the second are facility fees or the, or the income that comes in to the medical center. And it's important to note that we have zero role in negotiating those rates. Those rates are all negotiated by the medical center. So they can be skewed one way or the other, depending on how those negotiations go. So I'm gonna walk you through a real life example of a profit loss statement of a colorectal surgeon. So we're going to focus first on the professional revenue or bucket number one. And so this is a relatively busy colorectal surgeon who did about 280 cases that year um, and about 8,700 RVUs. So having been in practice for the amount of time that I've been in, that's, this would be considered a busy colorectal surgeon. And you can see that their inpatient and outpatient billings are relatively balanced and their collection rate based on those billings is about 30%, which is actually uh, sort of an industry standard for the amount of money revenue that's collected based on billings. So that means that this surgeon brought in a total clinical revenue of $735,000. Now, don't forget what we talked about earlier as it relates to uh, the ins and outs formula. So we need to take out the total direct costs. These are the costs that are associated with directly with doing business. And all of a sudden, those direct costs drop our revenue down to $6,000. Well, what are these direct costs? Well, you have to pay for your salary, for a malpractice, your fringe benefits, your practice allowance, your office staff, all the things that are necessary for you to do your job. But don't forget, there's also indirect costs that come out. So things like paying the payroll people, the IT people, the dean puts in their tax, um, administrative overhead, things that seem sort of nebulous, but regardless, there's a bottom line number here of $102,000. So at the end of the day, after you've come to work every day for 365 days, you've worked your tail off and you meet with your hospital administrators and they tell you that you just lost them $100,000. And it puts a tear in your eye and you think about going home and telling the kids you have to take them out of private school because how are we going to be able to afford to live when we're losing money? Well, don't forget there's a second bucket. And that second bucket is a lot bigger than the first bucket. And that's really the facility revenue. So for those, this is the same surgeon doing these cases and generating a revenue of $4.5 million. Now, again, they take out the direct costs. They're different costs this time. So OR equipment, the nursing staff, housekeeping, radiology, labs. And then that gives you your contribution margin. Then the indirect costs come out. So HR, finance, IT, all these things. Depreciation. I don't even know what depreciation is, but they take it out of your bottom line. And so that means that you go from $4.5 million down to $1.6 million, but you're still positive. So you have your bucket one for the medical group and you have your bucket two for the medical center. 
And when you bring them all together and you consolidate the two, the amount of revenue that you generate based on the work that you're performing is over $5 million. You take out the direct costs, you take out the indirect costs. And to answer the question is, what are you worth to your institution? It means at the end of the day, they just made a profit of $1.6 million on the work that you did. So the next time an administrator tells you that they don't make money on the surgeon, you can ask them specifically, well, what about the facility revenue that I generate? So that's an important take home point. Now, beyond that, there's also other buckets of money that come in based on the work that physicians perform. So the state of Massachusetts gives free care dollars to nonprofit hospitals. So our hospital brings up in about $15 million a year from our state, just based on the free care that we provide. In addition to that, there's something called the Medicaid Supplemental Fund, the MSF. And in the United States, the federal government pays out about $49 billion per year to hospitals as part of this Medicaid supplemental fund. And our hospital receives about $50 million per year. And this is considered payment for the free care that we provide, some GMA, and for the gap between what we're reimbursed versus what some of the services cost. So this is additional funds that come in from the, from the federal government. And for the past several years, we've also been receiving additional federal funds for COVID relief and FEMA relief. And so if you add this all up, there's about $100 million that are going to come into a medical center that are all based on the work that the physicians are, are doing, but none of them goes down to the bottom line of your profit and loss statement. So always keep that in the back of your mind as well. Now, all that being said, there are changes coming. So we are definitely going to be moving from a fee-for-service model to a value-based care. And this is going to be happening in the short term. It's the future of U.S. healthcare. And the whole goal is to reduce costs and improve quality of care. It's an alternative to payment for quantity of care. And it's really focused on three key components of cost efficiency, care quality, and patient satisfaction. And that's how we're going to be reimbursed moving forward. We already have models in place called bundle payments. And so I'm not sure how many of you participate in those. But this concept is that a medical center is paid a fixed amount for the care delivered over a 90 day time period following an operation. And it's the organization's responsibility to make sure that we do a good job taking care of those patients and we minimize complications, we enhance outcomes, and then we determine how we distribute those funds amongst hospital um, service lines. It's the concept of shared risk and it's probably gonna change a lot of what I talked about earlier. It's not quite ready for time, prime time, but we're in that transition already. So let's move on to the second phase of the talk, which is surgeon compensation. So how do we find out about doctor salaries? Well, there's a few different ways. By word of mouth, by talking to friends and colleagues who trust one another, from benchmarking organizations. There was a recent ASCRS survey that I'll refer to. And then believe it or not, there's the internet. But to be perfectly frank with you, we really don't have a good grasp of doctor salaries for a lot of different reasons, which I'm gonna highlight and outline. So we can start like I did looking for the world's billionaires and you can just do a Google search. And Forbes, the same organization, has data from 2023 about the average salaries of US physicians. And this is their list that tells me three things. Number one, colorectal surgeons are not in the top 10 list. Number two, I should have listened to my wife and become a plastic surgeon. And number three, those gastroenterologists who we work with on a regular basis, looks like they're making more money than we are. So keep that one in mind. There are also organizations that set salary benchmarks. The three uh, most commonly referred to ones are the MGMA, the AMGA, and the AAMC. Now there are different variables that affect the validity of the data that they provide us. And that's whether you practice in an academic or private practice, the geography of your practice, survey response rates, and specialties as it relates to sample size. And what I'd like to do is, because we only have time for one of these, is sort of walk our way through the MGMA to give you a sense for, um, for the data that, that is used by most hospitals. I would say that the MGMA data is considered sort of the holy grail of what most hospital administrators suggest are the benchmarks for both RVU production and physician compensation. 
So when I learned about that about 10 years ago, I decided to educate myself and do a deep dive. And I literally grabbed the book at that time to better understand the, um, the rationale and the behind the scenes aspects related to the MGMA data. So as it turns out, this is actually a survey process. The MGMA sends out invitations and they were mailed to over 6,000 medical practices across the United States. And they actually had 623 of those surveys returned. And so everybody says, wait a second, they sent out a survey and there was a 10% response rate. And this is what we consider the holy grail. And the answer is yes. And so sample size is also an issue. So when you look at academic surgeons, and this is the most recent MGMA data from 2022, you can see here for colon and rectal surgeons, they received responses from 22 different practices or a total of 79 colon and rectal surgeons across the United States. And remember, there are 1,400 of us in the United States. So maybe the sample size isn't so great for colorectal surgery, but what about general surgery? Well, here are their general surgery numbers in academic practice. 27 practices, 242 surgeons responded out of 18,000 in the United States. So not a great representative sample. And this is how they report their data. So I showed colorectal surgery and general surgery here. Here are their counts. They give you a mean, a standard deviation, the 25th percentile, median, 75th percentile, 90th percentile. And so just to break it down for general surgery, you can see the sample size, again, was 242 surgeons. The mean income was $407,000. The median income was less, 387. And for some reason, most hospital administrators only pay attention to median, and I suspect I know why. And amazingly, the standard deviation was $160,000. So in summary, the MGMA, which is considered really the gold standard, has a 10% response rate, has a very small sample size, and a standard deviation, which is like not even reasonable. There's no way this paper would ever be published, but this is what we use for physician compensation. Now, because of that, our society, ASCRS, decided to try and gather our own data. And in 2018, they sent out a physician compensation survey, and this was reported upon in 2020. Now, this entire report is available on the ASCARS website for all uh, members to have access to. It's about a 45-page report, and there's a lot of information there you might find valuable, so feel free to look at it. But again, looking at the numbers, so the survey was sent out to over 4,000 ASCRS contacts. 788 surgeons in active practice responded. 479 from 283 organizations provided compensation data, and 297 also provided RVU data. So when you look at survey response rates, we had about a 20% response rate, but only 12% um, compensation data was provided and 7% response rate for RVU data. So again, very, very limited data as it relates to the general practice of colorectal surgery. But to summarize, to summarize, the average uh, RVU production for a colorectal surgeon is somewhere around 8,900 RVUs. And that is actually the example that I gave you earlier in the profit and loss statement, 8,900 RVUs. And the average compensation for a colorectal surgeon is $425,000. So this is the data that was gathered by the ASCRS survey. So what about the newspaper? Where else can we find? So this Washington Post article was published um, earlier this year, stating that the average doctor in the United States makes $350,000 a year. And they asked a question why, because obviously they're being critical of that. So this led me to this paper, which I found quite interesting. This was a paper put together by economists for the US Census Bureau. And what they did is they looked at 10 million tax records from 863,000 physicians over 13 years. And what they found from tax return data, so no, no recall bias, no self-reporting, but actually US tax returns, is that the mean salary of physicians in the United States was $243,000. The median salary is a bit higher at 265, 
And the mean total income, when we look at all income for physicians, and that includes investments and earnings related to owning a business, was $345,000. When you look at their table one, it provides a lot of data. And so the first thing that sticks out is the, is the sample size for all the different groups that they looked at and how they were able to break them down based on specialty. So again, 863,000 physicians. But when you specifically look at surgery, you can see that there are 77,000 surgeons included in this analysis and the mean total income. So again, it's salary plus investments that come in is $521,000. And so surgeons do well in the United States. Um, what's sad about this data is if you look at primary care doctors, you can see they make about half the amount that we make. So just like I recommended that you have your children become soccer players, I would suggest if your children go to medical school, have them become surgeons. And if they are gonna become surgeons, then you can see who's at the top of the list here, the neurosurgeons tend to make the most money followed by orthopedic surgery, and then uh, many other surgical specialists. As we go down the list, we eventually get here to colorectal surgeons, or as we're commonly called proctologists. And our, um, our salary income is $458,000 um, according to, to these tax records. Um, What's also interesting about this data is that despite our extra year of training and our double board certification, we're only compensated $600 more than our general surgery colleagues. And there's only one specialty who logs more hours, so 63 hours per week, and that was cardiac surgeons who are 66 hours per week. But the good news is that there are many uh, physician specialties that are below us. And again, sadly, family practice is at the bottom of the list at $230,000. So um, does that make you feel good? Well, hopefully it does, but um, I'm gonna rain on the parade a little bit. So don't forget about what comes out of that income. And so look at taxes. So all of us fall in the 35 to 37% tax bracket. So that what that means is if you make $400,000 per year, your take home is only cut down to $260,000 per year. And then if you convert this to an hourly rate wage, again, we work about 60 hours per week. We allot for about four weeks of vacation time, which means we work about 2,880 2, hours per year. So that means we're making about $138 per hour before taxes. We're making about $90 per hour after taxes. And if you think about our own lives and the things that we spend money on, and anyone who owns a house or has a car and needs work done, you'll see that we're not really being paid that much compared to other people out there that we, um, we interact with on a regular basis, including lawyers who make significantly more than us on an hourly basis. And now don't forget about loans, right? So it's not like you finish high school and you become a colorectal surgeon. So according to the uh, US Department of Education, 75% of people graduating from medical school come out with student loans. 75%. And the amount of student loans has been going up considerably over the past 15 years. So from 2000 to 2015, it's gone from about $100,000 to $200,000 in student loans. And the average student finishes out of medical school with $246,000 of student loans, which they need to pay back. And don't forget about other variables. So gender and race equity, years in practice, and geography. So there's no question that women surgeons are paid less than male surgeons. And the US Bureau of Labor Statistics highlights the fact that of the five occupations where men have higher salaries than women, physicians and surgeons are number one, probably in the range of 15 to 30% less, worse for black and Hispanic women. And fortunately, although we have plenty of work to do, this discrepancy was not necessarily highlighted or seen in the recent ASCAR survey. Years in practice is another one. And so whether you look at that US Census Bureau evaluation or the ASCAR's compensation survey, there's no question that your earning peak is somewhere around age 50 or 16 to 20 years in practice. And so for those of us who are age 50, I think we all feel about the same, that it's all downhill from here, including our earning potential. Finally, geography. Again, whether you look at the US Census Bureau data or the ASCAR's compensation survey, those surgeons who practice in the middle of the United States earn the most, where those on the east, on the east, on the east coast of the United States earn the least. 
And so I guess my recommendation here is that when you turn age 50, move to North Dakota or South Dakota, and you'll be able to have your greatest earning potential. Now, don't forget about living either. So if you have kids, think about paying for school and college. One hint is don't even waste your time filling out the financial aid application because you're not going to qualify. I had two kids in college last year. We don't qualify for any financial aid. And I spent about $160,000 uh, sending them to college after taxes because they went to private colleges. If you need to buy a house like most of us do, don't forget the interest rates are 6.5% and the real estate market is through the roof. Don't forget about inflation. And so inflation usually sits around 2% per year, but because of the issues related to COVID, the numbers have skyrocketed over the past three years, as has the cost of living. And although most hospital employees get cost of living or inflation increases on an annual basis, I say that that's very rare to occur in the setting of physician compensation. And at the end of the day, we do a lot of work for free. You know, we typically get reimbursed for the patient care that we provide, um, but, um, and sometimes for the research that we do, but most of what we do from teaching community service is completely um, uncompensated from a financial perspective. And just think about all the committees you sit on, the conferences you go to, the annual trainings we need to do, your licensing boards, taking call and whether the frequency changes or not, it doesn't change your income the journal work, the societies, the boards that we do, the meetings that we're part of, very rarely are surgeons compensated for any of that, nor do we have FTE offsets to help fund a lot of that. I think at the end of the day, what we're doing is that we're satisfying our, our own pr professional interests and we're helping to build our own brand, whether it's a personal brand, a division brand, a department brand, or even an institution brand. Now, the good news is that there are actually other additional revenue streams available for us as professionals. So you can do moonlighting. You can get um, call. You can get paid for doing call, whether it be trauma call or general surgery call at variable rates. You can do legal reviews and become an expert witness. You can be an industry consultant and you can get hourly rates, stipends, or even equity or stock in companies. Philanthropy is another great way to bring in revenue, whether it be to your um, to your institution or to your group itself. Endowed shares typically cost about $1.5 million or higher to endow. They produce about a 4% return. And that typically um, funds that the holder can utilize to either reinvest in their, uh, in their division or make strategic investments as it relates to their business plans. There's intellectual property that you can help develop and get revenue from. And particularly for people who are in prior practice, there's facility, facility ownership as well that can generate revenue. So there are a lot of different ways to supplement your income. So uh, because of the issues that we talked about, I think that there are a lot of people who may not necessarily be happy with their current state, and they may be interested in negotiating different options from their institution. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time taking this taking this, uh, bringing it all together and maybe making some recommendations or putting some ideas in your head about where you might be able to take things from a negotiation perspective. And particularly for those uh, fellows and new surgeons who are participating, don't feel awkward. It's your time. You've sacrificed many good years. You've been working at becoming a colorectal surgeon since you were about 17 years old. You've been working 80 to 110 hours per week. You spent about five years as a resident with an on-call and a post-call haze. Most of your college friends are 10 years into their careers and they're, they're really skyrocketing, particularly from an earning potential. And I can promise you that nobody has worked harder than you have. And you will make plenty of present and future sacrifices for your employment. And I will also remind you that just based on selection, you are all first round draft picks. You have so much to bring to the table. And I can also promise you that the top administrators in your hospital all make more money than you do. And I'm gonna give you an example. So several years ago, our UMass nurses decided to go on strike. So part of the strategy is the hospital decided to publish their reimbursement. And I will tell you that the average nurse at UMass Memorial makes $135 per hour. They have 37 paid days off per year and we contribute $60 million to their pension on an annual basis. So if we step back and we compare that to a surgeon, 
I already told you that we make about $130 per hour. We get about 20 days off per week, so four weeks of vacation. And we very rarely do any surgeons have any pension. So you shouldn't feel bad about asking for more. And when we looked at the AFCRS compensation survey, about a third of surgeons were either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with their, comp their current con compensation. So most compensation models are either RVU-based, volume-based, or collection-based. And by standard design, either you have a base salary, so you get an X amount of money per year, regardless of how much work you do, or most places have a base salary plus a production bonus. So you're compensated based on your RVU production beyond a certain set threshold. And really these compensation models reward production over quality, again, speaking to the value-based care that I talked about earlier. They don't always encourage teamwork. So sometimes it can put members of a division at odds with one another as they're competing for business. And it definitely dis disincentivizes time away from work. So the more work you do, the more money you make. So you might not wanna take as much time off for vacation and work-life balance. So when you look at uh, the ASCRS compensation survey, you can see here that um, the average reimbursement per RVU is about $50 per RVU for those RVU-based compensation models. And when you look at the, uh, the collections-based compensation models, it's about 55% uh, percent of your collections can go uh, towards your, your compensation. So there are different ways to structure these, but again, they're all based on the amount of work that you do. So as you prepare for negotiation, I think it's critical that you arm yourself with knowledge. A lot of the items that we discussed at the beginning in part one, which was related to the business of surgery. So understand the allocation of expenses. Recognize the extra revenue streams that come into your medical center, as well as some of the downstream revenue of the work that you bring in. And have a ballpark understanding of salaries. So have a sense for other surgeons as a benchmark and have an idea about what the administrators make. And I'm gonna give you a little tip. There is a website uh, called GuideStar or guidestar.org. And this publishes the 1099 tax returns on all nonprofit hospitals across the United States. And so if you create an account and you look up your hospital, you'll be able to see the top earners in your institution. You'll see exactly how much your CEO and your CMO and your hospital president make on an annual basis. It helps to inform you about the magnitude of salaries. And then I think it's also important to think about creating a mechanism to share that facility revenue. Remember the larger amount of revenue that comes into your institution based on the work that you do. And consider that a market investment in you or your division. So establish a partnership with the medical center. Talk to them about the market rates for the services and the programs that you provide and see if you can get a subsidy or income or support from the facility revenue that you're generating. Of course, Oh, sorry. You need to uh, be careful as it relates to uh, Stark laws. And then remember the free care and the uh, Medicaid supplemental pools and the money that's available there that does not really come down to the physician level. And then always think about gain sharing. As you create programs and you think about generating more business, if you're going to put the work in to generate more volume and business for the medical center, talk to them about having a portion of that come back as a reinvestment to you or into your service line. Now, outside the numbers, think about where they would be without you. So think about the multidisciplinary care team without a colorectal surgeon. I also think about all the referrals that come in based on the, the, um, the relationships that I have in the community that I've developed over the years that wouldn't necessarily be coming to my hospital and might be going to the hospital across the street. Think about the overarching programs, the marketing campaigns that they want to use to drive so specialty care to your hospital. Where would the residency program be without you? And would the medical school even exist if they weren't physicians to help support the medical students? And so I want to focus on the multidisciplinary care team aspect of it and referrals to your system, or what I like to call you being the portal of entry. And so as I mentioned earlier, I thought about the fact that I get so many referrals from physicians who are not affiliated with UMass Memorial, from competing hospitals, from private practice, and I thought about rectal cancer, for example. So when I'm referred a patient for rectal cancer, I realize that I'm going to do their surgery, but they're also going to end up receiving a lot of care at my medical center, whether it be related to, um, whether it be related to medical oncology, 
radiation oncology, uh, lab services, radiology, you name it. And so what I did is I asked my uh, department of surgery administrator and I gave him four medical record numbers of patients who were referred in to me from outside of UMass. And I asked them to follow their care for one year and look at all of the revenue uh, and collections that came in based on the care they received. And I found that although there are variable numbers based on the payers that they had, on average, we collected $76,000 per patient over that one year of care. And only about a quarter of that came to colorectal surgery. The rest that went to other service lines. And so we're generating a lot of revenue for other service lines based on referral patterns. And if you think about it, if you think about building a program of 50 rectal cancers per year, we're talking about bringing in close to $4 million to your institution. And so there's a lot of value there. And there's a lot of work that can be done from a business plan perspective based on downstream revenue from the business that's reputation in your brand. In addition to that, there's a doctor shortage in the United States. And when you talk about supply and demand, who knew that there were so many surgeons in Portugal? Iceland has more physicians than we have in the United States. And in addition to that, the double AMC recently published this projection as it relates to physician shortages in the United States. And within the next 10 years, they are projecting 15 to 30,000 shortages in, across all surgical specialties here in the United States. So there is a real supply and demand issue. And so getting back to the original question about your financial worth to your institution, remember the professional collections, remember the facility collection, the free care pool, the Medicaid supplemental fund, the downstream revenue, the research funds and the philanthropy that we haven't even really spoken about and recognize that you are a high valued, low supply, high demand commodity that fuels the hospital engine and you bring in a lot of money to your hospital. So, um, so the problem is, is there are really just too many chefs. So there's a division chief, there's a department of, chair, department of surgery chairman, the service line VP, the medical group president, the medical center president, the medical center CEO, and the medical school dean. And they all have their own agendas and they wanna hang on to whatever money they can. And so what I tell people that is in most situations, when you ask, they have the money, they just don't want to give it to you. And so you have to figure out how to make a good argument to get the, that money to steer in your direction. So how do you get your piece of the pie? So right off the bat, there's low hanging fruit. So when you get your first job and you're negotiating, you tell them, listen, I have student loans I need to pay off. I need a down payment on a house. And most of the time, they're going to give you a signing bonus. But oftentimes, you have to ask for it. And I would say on average, it's about $25,000. In addition to that, you need to move across the country and there, 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 are, there are costs associated with that as well. And so most institutions are gonna pay for your relocation services, upwards of somewhere around 10 to $12,000. And then of course, they should be paying for you to maintain your continuing medical education, your professional dues, your, your licensing, your board, your board fees. And so you should have a practice allowance somewhere in the range of five to $6,000. Now, every once in a while, institutions might even have tuition assistance policies uh, that can contribute uh, to either you or to your children. That's definitely something to ask about as well. And so as you're negotiating for your job, then the, the things to think about are number one would be a salary. Number two, time to bonus plan. Sometimes they'll bring you on with a set salary for three years but you realize that you're gonna be busy really fast and you wanna you want to be part of that bonus plan. So you can talk about getting onto the bonus plan early or in private practice, time to become a partner with revenue sharing. There's a benefits package you need to think about from a retiring retirement contribution to benefits like medical and dental and life insurance. You can ask about low interest loans. Sometimes institutions have access to low interest loans for, for example, uh, paying off a house, a home loan, a mortgage. You might ask for equipment. So when I came to UMass, um, they didn't have the capacity to do transanal surgery. So I asked them to purchase us a TEM system or an endorectal ultrasound machine or a robot um, or an endoscopy tower from the operating room. Once you've started, you sort of lose all of your leverage and you wanna do that before you sign on the dotted line. You need to have adequate block time. Otherwise, how are you gonna generate revenue? You might ask for an advanced degree, whether that be an MBA or uh, some type of other advanced degree that might help you advance your career, but also present them with a return on their investment. 
protected time or an FTE offset. So most people are a 1.0 full-time equivalent, but if you want time protected for doing research or for teaching, you might have an opportunity to have protected time, which might decrease your RVU target. And oftentimes titles or roles or time or academic promotion come with stipends. So there may be additional funds coming in from the medical center and the medical school that come to your bottom line. So to conclude, you're worth way more than anybody will admit. While I can't give you any solid numbers, I think I've provided you with some, some ideas, some concepts, and some general ranges. I will tell you that you are your best advocate and you should work your best to get to benchmarks. And you should do it professionally, respectfully, and unemotionally. Remember, this is a business. You should be reassessing your value and value in intervals. So an X number of years in practice or at times of academic promotion. And remember that your earning potential is greatest around age 50. And you generally realize your real worth when you move or when you threaten to move. And there are definitely professional interviewers out there who are always looking at different job opportunities to see, is the grass greener or can they get an offer that allows them more negotiation power at their current institution? And then my, my last plea is that if ASCARS does end up sending out another compensation survey, participate, fill it out, and I think it can help all of us as we have a larger sample size to make these determinations from. And to really conclude, I, I wanna be sincere with you and tell you that it's really not all about the money. I truly believe that if you put your head down, you work hard and you produce high quality care, you will be rewarded. Everybody wants a good employee and someone who takes good care of patients and who likes to work hard. And remember, the average salary in the United States is $50,000 per year. So regardless of whether your salary is 350 or 450 or 550, we are all in the top 1% of earners in our country. And what really matters is job satisfaction. It's about having flexibility, a good work-life balance, a satisfactory salary, job security, career advancement opportunities, and good working conditions. Because at the end of the day, these are the people that we spend most of the time with and we want a good, healthy work environment because we're spending more time with these people than we are with our own family. So I'd like to open this up to questions and, um, and hopefully uh, you learned something and um, it helps you as you consider your own role at your own institution. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Mikkel. That was a great talk. Um, you know, it's a little sobering, um, but uh, we all are living it and we, uh, we understand. I think this is really great for some of our younger members who are going to be, you know, going out looking for their first job. So, so thank you. We do have some questions in the Q&A um, and we'll just throw these out. Um, one is from John Conan. How do you recommend beginning to understand all of this to be able to negotiate more effectively? Should you join certain hospital committees? Yes, yeah, a great question, John. Um, you know, I think that it's it's really important that you just educate yourself. And I think um, being part of these conversations, I think reading, I think um, learning from the example of others are really the best ways. And I think it just, to be perfectly honest with you, it takes time and finding a good mentor out there makes a big difference. Thank you. I, I just uh, want to add, can I add to that answer? Um, it also takes time to know who the person in the hospital is to get the information. It took me four or five years to figure out the guy who crunches the numbers and will give you your contribution margin. You just have to find that person who does that. There is somebody in every department and they, if you are kind, they will share them with you. Yeah, and I think finding good allies at, in, at your institution, I mean, remember, it's always like us against them, but it's not always us against them. We, we, we really want to work together as a team and figure out how we can do a better job together. So I think finding the right people who have, you know, have similar uh, mindset, similar go goals and want to help you become successful are going to be those people that help help you figure all that out. Um, another question is from uh, Hernan Sanchez Treo. Do you have any recommendations to avoid problems with Stark laws when building a partnership outpatient surgery center within your hospital? Yeah, so it can be tricky business. I know Steve has a, a better perspective on this, but um, you know, you 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 have to be careful. You're not steering uh, referrals, and we're we are actually 
um, particularly uh, in a good scenario here at UMass because it's a common entity that that relates the medical group and the medical center. So, um, so they're co-owned and there's less of an issue from a Stark law perspective. But I think as long as um, you're, you're, everything is, is being managed under fair market value and everything is, is out in the open, then I think you're going to be relatively protected from that. Do you have any comments on that, Steve? Additionally, there is a, a one third, one third, one third rule where you have to do a third of your patients have to be outpatient procedures and a third of them have to be done in a center that you own um, and that you cannot be paid for volume or referrals. So there, there are specific rules about it, but it is a, a very viable and uh, available source of additional income. And most hospital systems have appreciated, if you looked at, at Justin's talk, the money does doesn't necessarily come from your work, but comes from the facility fee and the hospital systems understand that. And so a lot of them are looking at joint ventures with physicians now because they understand that the physicians drive the engine, but if they share that, that they can share in that revenue as well. Uh, next question. Um, do you have any insight on non-compete clauses on our contracts that may limit our flexibility to work, especially in larger cities? Okay, so it depends on the on the state that you uh, that you work in. So, for example, Massachusetts does not have non complete causes clauses, and um, and I actually was at at a meeting recently where I think there's some le legislature that's soon going to be passed that's going to outlaw um, non complete cause clauses across the country. So I think it's going to be less of an issue moving forward. Agreed. Okay, this is a good one. Thoughts on the Sullivan Cotter survey versus MGNA? Um, seems like our administrators always pick that survey that favors their agenda best. They sure do. Um, I'm pretty sure that our hospital just engaged Sullivan Cotter, and so I'm curious to see how that whole thing evolves. But there's no question that they choose the survey that looks best for them. And like I said even earlier, they like the median numbers because they're lower than the mean numbers. And so um, they're always going to um, to to use the numbers that are more favorable for them. And that's why I think it's critical that you look at the process and the data behind. It's just like when we critically evaluate a research study, you, know, you should really get into the, the methods section and try and figure out how valid those numbers are. And then um, I think we need to do a better job of coming up with, uh, with uh, you know, ASCRS data in order to provide to combat some of these um, some of these surveys that we don't think are all that accurate. Absolutely agree. If we do our survey again, uh, everybody needs to participate because that'll be our our strong firing points. Okay, um, Dr. Marcello wants to uh, wants to know: Do you think fifty dollars per RVU is the current average number across the U.S. for colorectal surgeons? I mean, it's a, it's a, like it's impossible for me to answer any of these questions. I mean, it's the number yeah. that is in the ASCRS survey, and you know, it's you know, it's I, I've seen ranges from a comp from compensation models anywhere from forty to sixty. So I'd say it's in that range. Right, Justin, can um, you answer the the where you said we were the colorectal surgeons are getting reimbursed at a hundred dollars an RVU? I think that that is is a viable negotiation if you're working for a hospital system to say okay at at 45 percent or 40 percent overhead that's 60 dollars in our view i think that may be a, a point but I, I don't remember the exact slide you had yeah so the slide was actually re referring to payments per rvu so payments coming in so i think it'd be hard to make that argument for reimbursement just because of the indirect indirect cost they're going to pull out of that so that's just more payments than than compensation right Okay, we just have a couple more minutes here, but we still have lots of good questions. Um, let's see. One topic that wasn't touched upon is whether private cultural surgeons make more than academic surgeons, and if so, by how much? I think that's probably impossible to answer. Um, and again, if we do our Ask Our survey again, um, that could ha probably be hashed out um, some more. Um, another person says, how do we approach negotiating increases in dollars per RVU compensation? For example, MGMA compensation, so it's lower medium RVUs for colorectal surgery versus general surgery. 
Yeah. Um, so good question. It's like, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So when you when you when you go into those negotiations and you tell them that there is, you know, whatever the number was, 50 colorectal surgeons in their survey, it's kind of hard to make, you know, sweeping recommendations. And so that's why, you know, I really think we need, you know, better data um, from a lot of different sources in order to go into those negotiations. And I think at the end of the day, it comes down to that, you know, total margin, the profit loss uh, as it relates to your service line. But again, you, okay. you need to know your service line too. You need to know when you're doing endoscopy in the hospital owned endoscopy center where the HOPD rates are higher and they're getting compensated and what you're generating revenue there, what you're generating revenue of referrals to a, a cancer center where they're getting all the chemotherapy and radiation. So all of that, that, that extra bucket that, that Justin showed of four and a half million dollars on top of the, of the, you know, million dollars that you brought into the hospital for your, your cases, that's, that's really where the number is. And you have to say, listen, if I don't do this and, you know, I've developed a brand and I've done all this extra work, that piece is what you go to them with. And you say, this is how I would, I, this is what I bring to you. I need you to share. Yeah. All right. Well, unfortunately, um, our time is up. Um, I think this was a great talk. Um, a, I'm sorry we didn't get to every single question. Um, I will use this to um, encourage people to sign up and attend our in-person leadership uh, uh, conference. It's going to be in La Jolla in February. Um, it's going to be uh, very in-depth. Um, we're going to have a whole session, a whole uh, half a day um, about negotiation strategies. And I think that this is a great segue into that. So um, I hope we can see a lot of you there in person. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Makel and Dr. Fassler and Asgards for helping us organize it. And I think if anybody has any 